couple of traveling pieces. I've been writing these really short prose pieces, and then I send them off to magazines, and magazines like short prose pieces because they can sort of tuck them in the bits and corners of the magazine, so they have a tendency to get published, which is always a good idea. Um, so I'm going to read you two. One is about a trip. One of the things about, about driving, too, is it's a lot like being a writer. You sort of, you, you're really sort of lonely and invisible, but visible at the same time. Being a writer is a very odd profession because you write these things and you send them out into the world and they're very personal and they're very real, but nobody knows you wrote them, right? So it's a, for me, being a writer is it, it is a bit of a lonely profession, but it's a way of being really visible in the world and totally invisible at the same time. And driving's a little bit like that. Driving is like this time out of time when you're not really connected to the world, especially when you're all alone, it's just you and the stereo and the car and the miles. And, it's kind of like a, a, a little, almost a mini death. It's very strange. So I, I don't know. Here's a story about driving. <clears throat> Except this one, I wasn't alone. I was with my two darling sons. And they were driving, actually, part of the time. It's called Night Trek. Let's go, says my son impatiently. He's been golfing with his dad all day. This morning, I said to him, so when are we leaving? This afternoon, as soon as I get home. <laughs> so, all day, I pack, I clean, I go to the garden and back again, waiting for the familiar rumble of his ancient van. Now, it's 10.30 at night. I'm ready to sleep. Finally, he comes in the door with his brother, both of them grinning and happy without a care in the world. Come on, he says, let's go. I point out, reasonably enough, the lateness of the hour. Say, well, why don't we sleep? Get up early in the morning and leave. But he's all ready to go. He's very. Hey, this is nothing. When I left for tree planting camp, partied all night, left that morning, drove all day, partied the next night. Hey, come on, old lady, he says. And he grabs my bags. So we load everything, get in the van, me in the back in the sweat, stinking sleeping bag, which he'd been sleeping in for three months, with the new kitten and the dog and the two boys up front, drinking a beer each and toking up for the drive. <laughs> is the tree planting van. It's a 72 Ford Econline, held together by duct tape and rust. The wind howls like a manic flute through the duct tape around the windows. There's duct tape on every crack, duct tape around the motor mount in front, duct tape over the back doors. He put it there in tree planting camp in a futile attempt to keep the mice out. I read in some magazine or other that because of global warming, there's an explosion of white-footed deer mice in the Rocky Mountains. So people are dying of hantavirus. I lie on the foamy in the back, watching trees flash by in the mountains. It's a warm June night. The kitten curls under my neck, purring. I can hear thousands of mice scratching in the insulation in the walls. <laughs> After a couple of hours, I can't sleep, so I volunteer to drive. I used to have a van just like this one. It steers like a boat in heavy seas. It has brakes if you stand on them and pump. The signal lights and the dash lights quit long ago. Nothing on the dash works anyway. Who cares? Put gas in every 150 miles, he says, then he goes to sleep. If there is such a thing as an organic vehicle, this should qualify. I try to figure out what all is on the, in the heap on the dash. There's a plastic Jesus with a safety pin in its head. There's a big roll of duct tape empty potato chip bags, pictures of my grandson, empty cardboard coffee cups, a thermos, books, socks, change, comic books, spare van parts, and a whole lot of other stuff. And there's a whole lot more stuff on the floor. We have a big coffee and cassabar, fill up with gas, pump up the flat spare tire, and then I go on, trying to talk to my other son over the roar of the motor and the whistling of the duct tape, dodging deer over the, blue, over the blueberry pulse and a cop in Grand Forks stop in Greenwood and change drivers, but the coffee keeps me from sleeping. So I lie in the back again and listen to the mice chewing the insulation just above my head. I wonder if this kitten is old enough to hunt mice. And I think about all the trips we have made, have been making since I was a child, out of the interior to the coast, and back again, out of the mountains to the flatland, and then back up all those big hills. It's always the same trip. You start off high and energetic and end at someone's house at the coast flatter than this van's ancient spare tire. 
About three quarters of the way, every mile endured becomes just another mile endured. It's eight hours in a good vehicle with one or two stops, or 12 or 15 hours in bad weather or with kids or driving a van like this one. When you live in the interior, you have no choice. Endlessly, you do the beyond hope shuffle back and forth out to the bright lights of movie theaters, records, bookstores, university, friends, conferences, whatever excuse you can come up with. And then back to the dark shadows between the mountains where you can hide forever. I get out when we stop in Asturias. The sky is a bright and amazing salmon in the west instead of the east. I go pee in the husky truck stop. It's been renovated. It's far too bright and shiny. Damn progress, anyway. How many plates of terrible, terrible fries have I eaten here? Last time we stopped, it offered poutine, borscht, and spanakopita on the menu. See, I said to the boys, there's hope for this crazy country after all. <laughs> the kitten goes to pee in the bushes and then trots at Nat's heels back across the parking lot in among all the giant throbbing diesels stops to bat at a moth. The dog pees on as many tires as he can manage. We go on, we stop and hope for breakfast, always at the same restaurant, because it has really big breakfast. There are three photo radars set up between Hope and where we turn off for the ferry onto Highway 10. I'm wide awake at the ferry landing, and then I fall asleep, sitting upright, still talking. <laughs> I'm old. I'm too old for this, I think. I walk between so many cultures. I'm 50. That's really old. I walk into a basement where the air is blue with pot smoke to get my son and feed him lunch. He tells me he thinks I ought to smoke dope again because now that it's so much stronger than it used to be. <laughs> I laugh. What about that acid we took, I say? Pure as crystal. That shit you take is like mud mixed with strychnine. They all look up when I walk in. They have green or red or no hair and tattoos they'll live to regret. They're momentarily jerked away. Startled by the presence of the old lady, and then they relax. It's, it's only Nat's mom. She's like, you know, cool. She's that crazy writer. I want to flop onto the store with them. Uh, I'm sorry. I want to flop onto the floor with them. And then tell them stories that begin, well, when I was your age. I want to relax on the flea-ridden floor and reach out for the joint, but I don't. I'm old and snarly and arthritic, so I only hover, smiling too much, swinging above them, smoking in their damp, littered basement. And I think of all the things I'll never, ever be able to tell them, never bother to tell them, about being 18 and stoned and smart and impatient as all hell, and then turning 50, seemingly, right after. I wake up when we drive off the ferry, and I feel great except for the duct tape howling in my ear. Tomorrow night there'll be a party, and I'll hang out among the guitars and the beer, playing with my grandson. And then I'll put on a business suit, go to the conference I came to attend, and then a few days later, I'll catch another ride back up all those long and indifferent hills towards home. Mm -hmm. Sort of a prelude to leaving the Kootenays. <coughs> it's called Exile. Driving alone across the country, whoops, is the perfect suicide dream. It's like being dead for just a little while. A while ago, I drove from Athabasca down through Calgary, stopped in Fort McLeod onto the foothills, foothills through the Rockies to the Kootenays. For the past two months, I've been living in other people's houses and living other people's lives. I was tired of smiling, getting up at early hours, eating breakfast when I didn't feel like it, eating what was cooked for me, hanging up my wet towels, stopping at two glasses of wine. When you live in other people's lives, you silently count your own points, being polite, well-behaved, clean, and quiet. Now, every place I saw, I imagined stopping and finding a place, a house, and simply staying there, and again having a life of my own. And each life would be its own kind of place. In northern Alberta, it would be among the poplar and aspen and cottonwood, the gruff farmers, the oil wells and hydrogen sulfide flares, flat stretches of brush and sly, greedy trees busily reclaiming any unplowed land. I wanted to stop in Pegan country near Brockett, where someone had spray-painted a sign saying, Free Nation, No Treaty Indians, and two men were standing beside a fence post in a tractor stretching wire. The wind was blowing hard, hard out of the crow's nest. The horses stood with their heads down and rumps pointing to the mountains. I saw myself going into a house there, 
like that little white one, coming in and pouring a coffee from the pot and sitting by the table and talking with everyone about the shitty weather. Or down through the other side of the crow's nest, maybe I could live in Fernie and never go skiing. I could have a little house in the dark mountains among the elk and the moose and the hunters in the fall. I could live alone in all that snow. I kept thinking of my favorite Adrian Rich poem about driving across the country through towns she might have lived and died in, lonely. And then I thought of the place I do live and have lived for so long, all my life, and how peculiarly lonely it is there among people I've known all my life. It's writing that makes me lonely, I thought resentfully. It's all writing's fault. And I finally understood that writing made me an exile the first time I picked up a pen. I was six, and I've been watching from the sidelines ever since. And I've been trying to understand this place I fell into as an innocent baby exiled from paradise. And I've gotten nowhere. Abusive communities are as much traps as abusive families. The only remedy is escape, as Karen Connolly wrote. Why not run away? Maybe I could buy an RV, I thought, and understood that fantasy for the first time, too. Oh, I know so much about everything when I'm driving. I imagine myself freewheeling it alone down the Dempster Highway to the Arctic and standing there looking at the blue-black ice on the wild ocean. I could get a dog for company. I'd never have to get out of the damned RV except to go for long, windswept walks beside the Arctic. These days, they even have driving bank machines. Of course, I'd have to have some money, but that wasn't today's problem, just tomorrow's, when I got home and stopped being dead and high and alone on a windswept highway heading out of Alberta and had to get ready to move again out of the place I've lived my whole life. I've left so many times, always forever, and I've always returned. I've always wanted to write when I was driving. When I was a little kid, I liked to ride around the backseat of cars because I could dream there. I didn't get to do it much because we had a pickup. Four kids and two adults in the front seat of a 57 Dodge. Doesn't leave much room for dreaming. I tried the thing with trade recorders, but that's not dreamy or writing, it's just talking. And who wants to listen to their own babble all over again? It sounds so much better, safely locked away in your head. For the last four years, every week, I've driven 200 miles round trip to teach writing. The long fall fading into winter afternoons broke my heart regularly each week. The gold tinged hills blending with the blue smoke from the slash fires, the abandoned trailer beside the river bleeding pink, fading to yellow, bleeding pink, fading to yellow insulation out of its guts. The long distance with Mozart or Pink Floyd wailing from the stereo. At night, I drove back through a black tunnel with giant trucks crashing through the slush deer and elk peering from frozen sidelines. When I got home, I'd build up the fire, crawl into bed, watch David Letterman lay there listening to the snow hissing against the windows, and fall instantly, gratefully asleep, glad to be home, glad to be not driving anywhere for a while. Driving is like poetry. It's sad and glorious at the same time, always fading into the sunset, dancing along that razor edge, Pirouetting between tragedy and joy, aging parents, lost land, lost friends on one side, new grandkid, new friends, new life on the other. At 50, balancing, balancing on the yellow line between the life I've had and the death that's coming. Thank you. I have another writer to introduce here from Rosslyn, Almeida Miller, who some of you know as an instructor at the Kootenai School of the Arts. Others of you would know as the, um, the mother of the uh, Gold Rush bookstore in, in Rosslyn. Yeah, great bookstore, which is still carrying on, which I think is the first bookstore in BC that did the nice coffee with good books routine. And, uh, and it still is. So, Almeida's been writing for the last five years, coincidentally, since she sold her bookstore. Because I can tell you, you don't get a lot of time while you're running one. Um, she's written sports articles, she's written creative nonfiction, poetry and fiction, and she's heavily influenced by the work of Harriet Dewar, Michael Ondaatje, and Jeanette Winterson. Great writers all. And she wants her aims and aspirations. I asked her if she wanted to be somebody else's major literary influence, or at least just to get her verbs to agree. 
which is a good thing. That's what editors are for. So uh, her, uh, like Rita, uh, Almeida has a non-fiction piece, a, a very moving piece about adopting um, her little girl from Nepal called Thief of Roses, um, which was a co-winner of the 1997 event, uh, Creative Nonfiction. Event is a, a magazine comes out of Douglas College, and every year it has a creative nonfiction a contest, and they have three pieces and a bunch of runners up. Always great writing, so that's really something to look out for is that particular issue. Um, and uh, Almeida has just completed her Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at Eastern Washington University in June, and she's going to be today reading from her novel in progress, Tiger Dreams. So let's welcome Almeida to the Women's Festival, I think for the first time? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think this is the first year that I, I think I'm a woman, so that's why I'm here. That's um, great. Hmm? That's great. <laughs> uh, the novel that I'm going to, um, the piece that I'm going to read to you from Tiger Dreams, the, the concept of the novel um, started about five years ago, probably earlier than that, but I didn't know it. And uh, I thought I'd crack off a novel in a year, you know. Of course, five years later, I'm still working furiously on it. Um, my father passed away, and when he passed away, I realized I knew absolutely nothing about him. He was an Anglo-Indian from Pune, India, and had immigrated to Canada after the Second World War. And um, so just to make a long, very long story short, I uh, received, after my father's death, I received a, a bunch of letters from my great-grandfather to my aunt. And in it was a bunch of information that I had never heard before. One was that my, great, my grandfather was the superintendent of prisons um, where Gandhi was thrown into in Pune, India. And this novel basically tracks that uh, story of him and and his wife, Alice. Um, so this is a short excerpt, uh, well into the novel. Alice has malaria. I guess, I guess I have to say that through my whole exploration of the sort of patriarchal line of my family, I discovered my grandmother, and I, I discovered a very, very strong connection to her. And I do believe she, she shares the same heart condition that I have. And though she died of malaria, I believe that she also died um, of the heart condition that I have. So I'm just going to read a quote from Mohandas K. Gandhi. If someone gives us pain through ignorance, we shall win him with love. So this part of the book, Alice is leaving Pune and traveling to Bombay. <coughs> Say I, I brought my family over to India last year to research this. Alice believes she's going to die, and she knows it. So th those are, and Denzel is her husband. So those are the things, okay. Alice had left the logistics of transporting the luggage to Denzel. She had labeled the trunk, two trunks up for the baggage room, for the articles not needed for the voyage. Three carry bags labeled present use baggage room and she and Char Charlotte carried the small chintz bags, topi boxes, and provision baskets with them. Alice and Charlotte stepped into the rickshaw and wrestled with their skirts and bags. She turned to look at the children. Barbara, stretched tall like her father, was well on her way to womanhood. She would do well for herself, thought Alice. George, the middle child, precocious and a bit of a troublemaker, popped a football into the air with his knee. He waved and ran around to the side of the house to finish his game. He was definitely a concern. I must discipline him more, she thought. The youngest boy, William, stood on the stairs and waved vigorously. His crooked smile embraced an innate kindness, the sort of look given to chosen ones. She thought maybe it would be William that would change the world. Maybe he'll pick up from where I left off. She blamed herself for the fruit in the bowl that William grabbed that day the typhoid took hold of his tiny body and her motives were pure when she had brought the fruit home from the market. Her ignorance, though, was unforgivable. Gandhi had told her that. Motives alone cannot decide the question of a particular act being right or wrong. 
She waved at her three offspring. They were a perfect psalm, providence, really. She turned around, slumped into the seat, and pouted as the rickshaw driver turned the carriage around and ran down the lane. How could you ever explain to children that dying is not an act of desertion? Getting out of the gates was another challenge. A smattering of protesters hurled curses and groped at the women in the rickshaw. Alice pulled her topi down over her brow. Charlotte became flustered and shut it back. Please, Charlotte, Alice gripped the younger woman's leg. There is no use. Gandhi had been trying to unite the high and low caste Hindus to sign an agreement to eliminate touch untouchability. I think, he had said, that this miserable, wretched, enslaving spirit of untouchableness must have come to us when we were in the cycle of our lives, at our lowest ebb. Untouchability is an evil that is still stuck to the Indian, and it still remains with us. Alice had seen him racked with sadness to hear the fights in the streets, to know that there were still millions of Hindus unable to break the code of their caste. She had wanted to ask him about her own untouchability, why she never heard him speak out for women. She loved him for all that was right about his truths, but she wondered, too, if in her blindness she had forgotten to mention herself to him. The rickshaw jostled from side to side. They do not want to hear what either of us have to say. Let's just get out of here. They caught the train when the sun was still high in the sky, and the treacherous dust hovered like clouds of insects around their heads. Every conversation Alice attempted with Charlotte was met with monosyllabic grunts and groans. Where shall we go first? Alice asked. Hmm, Charlotte stared out the window of their coach. Not sure. There was such an absent-mindedness and general disinterest on Charlotte's part that Alice eventually turned her head to watch the landscape. Through the strange, soupy glow of the yellowed windows, the land appeared to have been flopped down like a large canvas tacked to the skin of the earth. Dry tufts of grass poked through in irregular patterns. A lone cyclist navigated the ditch, and the Marathi's thatch-roofed homes behind him were stuffed in between the trees and shrubs along the tracks. The sun fell rapidly below the clouds that gathered like snow-capped mountains in the west. There were places in the earth's crust where the insides were pushed outward into perfectly shaped fists, thumbs pointing skyward to God, or hills that appeared like the lapping and overlapping of a series of racehorses pressing for the finish. The brakes, like the claws of a cat scratching rock, slowed the train as the hills joined together. Where is the moat, the drawbridge, she thought. I am leaving this fortress forever. Along the flat valley floors, black puddles with frilly ridges of grass dotted the fields to the left of the tracks. Startling white lilies transformed into egrets and flew like secrets behind the olivine mesas. The edge of day was the color of burning butter, and Alice traced the horizon with her finger, wondering if she was the only one who saw how truly round the earth was. Hot wind puffed through the window as the train deliberated before a climb. This was the dream world before Alice died, the ponderous horn of the train, the swishing of metal wheels against the tracks, and then a break in the land and a softening of sound, a distant hiss, and always, always the constant prattle of the Indian. As darkness descended, it, it hid the earth's blemishes, the lost grasslands, the deforestation, the fluvial scars of the wet season, the shape of fear. She gasped, when she saw the back end of a large cat leap into the remaining forest. A liquid night now surrounded her, and the sky was the color of her mother's skin. And then a nomad's old oil lamp flickered against the purple hillsides. There a sleeping place, there a waking place, there a place to die. The horn said, come quickly, and the train sang solo into the night. Lenavla. Vendors selling coconut sweets and dried fruitcakes, chai, pan, samosa, they called out. Oil lamps dangled from posts and shed pools of light on the tatty orange-haired children digging in the dirt beside the train. Panwalas passed before her window and she dropped her head behind the rim of her topi to avoid insistence that seemed as much a part of the Indian as his religion. 
red gums against a black mall. Beyond Lenavla, the train began to climb, an agonizingly slow ascent into the thick night. Then the earth heaved and cracked, leaving deep gullies where railway tresses stitched the land together. Yellow lights came and went like holes poked through black paper. She felt like she had metal filings between her teeth and that a sea surged and receded somewhere in the base of her drum. Dear God, Alice, you look wretched, declared Charlotte after hours of silence. I'll be fine. Just give me a minute. I'll be fine. Alice grabbed Charlotte's hand that had gripped her knee and tossed it off. I said, Charlotte, I'll be fine. She hesitated as she slipped her handkerchief from the wrist of her blouse and dabbed the perspiration off her upper lip. Time was swallowing itself in one rapid tidal sweep. She chanted to herself, six respirations equals one venedica. Sixty venedicas equals one data. Sixty datas equals one day and one night. Frail moments of her life were jostling for position. Suddenly, her children not being with her was a dreadful error in judgment. Waiting to be reuni reunited in Bombay could prove unbearable. She dropped her head between her knees, and there she remained until the tingling in her lips stopped. Okay. <clears throat> Hello? Okay. So I'm going to do a speed reading of my story about a nun. <laughs> I was lucky enough, uh, while working on a, on a contract job for a, a book of stories for adult learners, uh, a literacy book essentially, uh, to go to a monastery in Saskatchewan uh, this last fall. And uh, it was amazing. All I did was write, sing vespers with the monks, eat all this great farm food, and, and Right. I did my laundry. That was it. So I got a whole bunch done. And uh, after getting my literacy book done and uh, typing out my mother's um, biography and um, working on uh, an intro for a community history up north and working on this film little project, I had this wonderful story about a nun come floating into my head because I love the music of Hildegard von Bingen. So this one is called Safe Journey, and I think I will just read uh, a quarter or a third of it. Um, the, the title I think I'm going to stick with is Give Safe Journey Through Death, which is part of a hymn. Sister Margaret is hobbling on her way to the dining room, and I hang back, waiting for Tina to catch up with me. Sister halts, her head tilted like a brown wren going gray. I come to a full stop and sidestep quickly behind the huge hanging Boston fern in the lobby. She turns around and squints, her meek little public face twisted into a mean piece of scrutiny. You, she croaks. Me, says Tina, who has finally gotten off her knees and made it outside the chapel. You wanted me, sister. There is a smile in Tina's voice. She has spotted me hiding behind the fern, but I dare not turn or make any movement. Yes, you, come up and... Her voice changes into the public voice, the sing-songy, reverent voice, the kindly neo-Irish trill that lulled me at first. Come up and walk with me, not behind me after all. We're going to the same place, are we not? Yes, sister, Tina says in her meek, obedient voice, no trace of the smile, much less laughter, as she swishes by me with her head down. Oh, hell, I'm sorry. Hail Mary, full of grace, etc. Now, we can't talk until after vigils, and I was assigned to dishes as well. So perhaps later, if Sister Philomena is watching television instead of patrolling the rooms to ensure rosaries, we'll talk. I walk softly and slowly so as not to overtake the strolling pair ahead of me. Sister Margaret is walking like Prince Philip with her hands clasped behind her back. Her dry, dull hair is pulled back into a messy bun at the base of her small skull, and her shoulders manage to be hunched up to her ears, the better to hang her humble head between them. She has inclined her left ear in Tina's direction because, bless my garrulous friend, she is able to prattle on about some malfunction in the laundry room, 
Oh my, oh my, chuckles Sister Margaret. Well, you can just imagine it, can't you? The floor practically covered in soap bubbles, and Marietta from the village started to laugh and laugh and couldn't stop, and Mother Superior comes out of her office right in front of the pair, turns and locks the door with a great clattering of keys. Sister Margaret pulls Tina back with one hand and stands in front of her, jutting her weak chin out, pr protecting the fledgling. How silly, what a weird little bird she is. Our Mother Superior, who prefers to be called Sister Maureen, barely notices the pair, just inclines her head gracefully and then swoops past them down the corridor with that walk of hers every single one of us knows. The smart, certain tapping of her polished black pumps. No nonsense, much purpose, and more energy at the end of the day than the rest of us have on rising. Her glossy black hair swings, grazing the green collar of the suit that flatters her wide shoulders and trim form as the skirt floats just, a, just below her slim knees. She runs four miles every morning, our undisputed alpha female. I don't know what it is that Sister Margaret does every morning. That's what I've got to talk to Tina about. Maybe I'm the only one that can hear the scraping and moaning and weeping that starts at 3 a.m. and ends at 6 a.m. when the first bell sounds. My request to change rooms this morning met with raised eyebrows from Sister Cecilia and an expression even more porcine than usual. White blonde eyelashes flap twice over those pale marble eyes. The scrubbed pink face expanded and then contracted as Sister C considered me and my seemingly unusual request. Yvonne, you want to move. You want to change rooms. You are a postulant for how long now? The rubbery lips pursed as if in thoughtful process. Five months, Sister Cecilia. My throat was suddenly dry and I suppressed a traitorous cough. Five months, I see. I had trouble sleeping. I had said that. Nothing more. Oh, lame, lame. Trouble sleeping. I see. I wanted to slap her for, for repeating like that. Her eyes grew, if possible, even rounder. Yes? She asked, looking over my shoulder. And there she was, right behind me, the sleepless penitent herself, with the I've got my little work to do for the Lord look on, humble, busy bird twirling a feather duster. Oh, I can wait, sister, she trilled and stay put. Sister C's fleshy face remained impassive. She gave me a direct look and said she'd be looking after this and then thanked me as though I'd just finished a small but onerous task. My respect for her climbed a notch. I permitted a small smile and a nod to leave me. My first choice is still Bridget, then Rachel, and um, can't decide between Thecla or Justina for third choice. Tina and I are painting the lounge together, happy enough to be breathing latex instead of peeling potatoes or washing dishes, just for the novelty of it and for the chance to talk freely about our permanent future names as nuns. We consider the lives of the saints who were burned, maimed, mutilated, and still, most miraculously, mere women whose names have endured for centuries. That new one, the tall girl from Zimbabwe, she wants Justina. First choice, we talked in the kitchen yesterday, I inform her. Okay, that makes it easier then. She does seem nice, at least she doesn't cry all the time. My friend is refreshingly free from sentiment. A woman of decisive action. A born Martha, but there is already a sister Martha here. Two would be confusing. Speaking of crying, I've been dying to talk to you about the novice. I lower my voice and look around. Sister Martha, the one at the end of the hall, right beside my room, this week, she started what seems a regular routine of rising at 3 a.m. Tina cuts me off. There's nothing wrong with early rising for prayers. Surely you're not suggesting such devout practice is wrong, are you? Tina, I keep forgetting, is always straightforward and prone to giggles, but most devout herself. No, I, I can't fault that, but it's not just quiet prayer. That I could handle. She moans and weeps and makes thumping noises. It's really quite noisy, I pronounce, almost primly. I decide not to tell her. I approach Sister Cecilia about moving me elsewhere. I haven't heard boo about my, my request, and that was three days ago. Hmm, penance. Tina diagnoses, giving the roller a careful immersion in the pastel coral paint. Whoever chose this color must have a thing for Florida Art Deco, or at least a love of flamingos. 
Can't one overdo penance, though? I decide to be diplomatic for once instead of running off at the mouth with judgment. It's one of my very worst sins. I soften my voice and add a shade of concern to the query. <coughs> Tina responds on cue. Only if it is a public display of humiliation or of serious bodily harm is achieved, she says so sprightly and matter of fact. It's been years and years since camel hair undershirts and dried peas in our walking shoes were in vogue. I know that. Tina knows that. I hold my tongue. I am prone to gossip. But I can't stop thinking, and I can't get enough sleep with this neurotic novice turning into a horse next door on a nightly basis. This is not a healthy combination for me. I must approach Sister C again. So, I obligingly switch back to topic number one for Tina. What do you think of Hildegard for me? Second choice, Sophia. And third, Carmelita. How disappointed I had been to discover Cecilia, patron saint of music taken up by the head of housekeeping. On the bright side, there are no saints with soap opera names, so we are spared Sister Ashley, Sister Brittany, or Sister <laughs> Tiffany. And likewise, brothers Chad or Brock. <laughs> I am bleeding. Oh, I've got three little asterisks here because it's a new thing. I am bleeding. The heavy twisting in my belly wakes me up in the neck, and I grab a pad from the box in my dresser on the way to the washroom. A toilet flushes as I'm opening the door, and Tina staggers out without seeing me. I give a little cough as she bends over the sink. She turns her bleary, sleep-smudged face in my direction. Oh, it's you, she says, and turns on the tap. Yup, I confirm and pop into a cubicle as a fresh set of cramps crescendos in my guts. I am now officially blessed with Little Red Riding Hood. Me too, she says, over the rushing of the water. Hey, just like that study says we would. I look down at the dark clots spiraling through the water, trailing brighter banners of blood. It's going to be hellish for me tonight. Study, I manage? Yeah, they studied nuns and college women in dormitories, and guess what? Most of us start having our periods at the same time. Pheromones, like bees. Tina is a registered nurse, headed for orphanages in Brazil, if she has the courage, which she tells me she is praying for many times daily, or a Catholic extended care home in Canada, if she can't face tropical heat, bugs, and snakes. Never mind that, I told her. It's the tropical police murdering street children and so-called army patrols raping nuns I'd be more concerned about. We stare at our own puffy white faces in the long horizontal mirror in silence, and then we hear her. <laughs> Gotta love it. So that's the story, the beginning. <laughs> it was great fun to write, and I have consulted two real nuns, or like one real nun, one real ex nun. So, um, and I've sent it to the New Yorker, you know, and they haven't sent it back yet. So every day that goes by, you think, well, maybe the New Yorker wants it, because I want to start at the top and get paid American dollars, right? <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. Um, it is my pleasure to bring up next a musician to end the cabaret. Uh, Jan Van Gold is going to do three songs, Jan? Yep. Yes. And Jan, where are you from? Caslow. Caslow. We've got musical women from Caslow here today. This is great. So, um, do you need to do any tuning up or anything like that? I'm tuning. And do you need a mic? Great. Oh, I'm out of here. Own person. Hello? First song I want to do is called Flying High.
She's great with words. So I do have lots of help uh, writing the lyrics to all my songs. Um, I have a wonderful friend, her name is Chris E, and she helps me fill in the gaps. Yeah, uh, if you also notice the beautiful uh, silk wall hangs, she also does those. Very talented oh. lady. Next song I'm going to do is called Wings. And I find myself going through a lot of changes these days. I'm kind of hoping everyone else is too, so I'm not alone. <laughs> Thank you. 
have to reach in. So um, the words to the chorus are drop ya, drop ya, drop ya, on name. So um, I'm going to go to you now.
a traditional woman's song. It's a woman's <coughs> work song and gathering together song. And now it poet. And now it poet.